Thank you very much, John. And actually, ye yesterday when we were having uh, the well-known Four Seasons in One Day in Melbourne, uh, someone said, Gil, you see, that's why we cannot walk or bike or use the parks in, in Melbourne because uh, of the weather. And everybody has excuses about the weather. I remember our, around this time last year, I was in Cuba, and people said, I was working for the government of Canada in Cuba, and people kept telling me, you see, Gil, here it's too warm. We cannot really walk. And then I took the flight back to Canada, and then they said, oh, here's too cold. <laughs> we always have excuses. So it's, it's nice to listen to what the children have to say. And one of the things, I was invited to Chihuahua to an urban forum, and I said, I want to talk to the children, and let's ask the children, how do they envision their city? How do they envision their city when they have their age of their parents and they have children their age? And look, people like Anna, half of the, her city, half of her community are parks. And then look at Edgar. Edgar is only 13, but at 13 he knows. For example, he said I, he wants fewer cars, and he said he wants more people walking and more people cycling. And then he had an area for pedestrians, for cyclists, for buses, and for cars. He's only 13, but he knows that if you mix cyclists and pedestrians, the pedestrian gets injured. If you mix cyclists and cars, the cyclist gets injured. So each one needs their own separate space. And then Elgar has public parks. And then low buildings with street level activity. The other day I was at the University of Toronto talking to the students of the masters in urban planning. And I said, you know, you better study really, really hard because the children in Mexico, when they are 13 year old, they can summarize urban planning 101 in one drawing. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, we gotta think this afternoon is, how do we wanna live? What, what kind of cities are we going to build? Like Melbourne and Sydney are growing very fast, like many cities in Canada. I mean, in 25 years, Melbourne is gonna have 30% more people. So how do we want to live, you know? There, at the end of the day, the cities are only a means to a way of life. It's not just about telling people, you know, don't waste a liter of gas to get a liter of milk. If the closest place to get a liter of milk is three or four kilometers away. So what kind of cities? How, how, how do we want to live? Uh, as, as we grow the new cities, we really got to make sure that we have parks within walking distance uh, of, every, of every home. And the reality is that in the last 40 or 60 years, we've been building cities around the world, thinking much more on cars' mobility than on children's happiness. And those two concepts are incompatible, because when we define their cities around cars, all we really get is more cars. And then we got to go out and invite our friends to help us cross the street. The roads are getting wider, the cars are going faster, we are living longer, so we have all their population. But when we define their cities around people, then we get more people, but we also get healthier and happier people. And also we get healthier communities and better quality of life. And actually, when I say quality of life, someone the other day said, Gil, don't even talk about quality of life. We're going through an economic crisis. Uh, well, the reality is that we live in an ever more globalized world. And in a more globalized world, the best people, they can live anywhere they want to. The best carpenters, the best medical doctors, the best engineers. So why would they want to live in Melbourne and not in Sydney or in Vancouver or in Copenhagen or in Paris or somewhere else? So the reality is that quality of life today is the most important tool of economic competitiveness. That's why parks are relevant. That's why parks are so important, because good communities is not so much a matter of engineering. It has so much more to do is with people. So I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm very I, I, I'm thankful to the organizers of this Congress. I think it's fantastic to make the link of public health and parks, because the reality is that public health in most countries around the world are, are becoming the best partners to get things done, to create cities in a different way, in a more healthy and more sustainable way. And this is about building broad alliances. And I think this is what this Congress is about. By the way, we used to be called Walk and Bike for Life. 
And, but people thought that we were just focusing, and now we moved into 880 cities, because when we were talking about what we're called walk and bike for life, people thought we were just about walking or cycling. So we were kind of put on a box. The reality is that we see walking and cycling as a means, not as an end. What we're really interested in is how are we going to create vibrant cities with healthy communities where people live happier and join public places. So that's why we moved into 880 cities as livable community advisors. But you know, sometimes we feel that we're facing a perfect storm because we see obesity crisis and global warming and traffic congestion and economic crisis. But at the end of the day, the perfect storms help because they can be the perfect opportunity. And it's also time to go beyond the baby steps and take some bold initiatives. So I'm gonna talk a few minutes on, on each one of these six initiatives. The first one, we gotta make a case for parks. Sometimes we go to these events and we talk about amongst parks people and we say, oh, you know, our politicians, they are so dumb, they just don't get it. You know? <laughs> and we are so smart. No, maybe we are the dumb ones because we have not been able to make the case. It's not for parks. So one of the things that I, with, with 880 cities, we have come to the acronym that parks improve the earth, the environment, the economic activity, the recreation, transportation, and health. And we gotta have be the benefits, almost like a list of benefits for each one of these, because maybe one of our counselors is into economic activity, so we gotta tell them about those benefits. But another one doesn't care about economic activity, but about the environment, so we gotta have the benefits. Let me give you an example of these benefits. For example, from the environment point of view, there is no doubt that walking or cycling has a lot fewer gases. From the point of view of transportation, you know, too many people are driving to the gyms to walk on the treadmills. <laughs> and, you know, a name is worth a thousand words. Well, And what happens? People go in here, they go up, they go inside, they pay a monthly fee. What do they do when they go in? They go up and down the stairs. They could have gone up and down for free on the other ones. You know, the reality is that walking, walking is a mode of transportation. Even in the wealthiest places and the most sprawl and wealthier places of Melbourne, uh, you know, at least a third of the people do not drive. You know, everyone under 17, 30% of the over 60 and so on. And if the place is not as sprawl, as if it's more compact and maybe not as wealthy, then more and more people. So walking is a mode of transportation. Now let's go to the health. You know, is this what the future looks like? You know, in the US, only 30, 25, 30 years ago, none of the states had even 10% obesity crisis. This is not overweight obesity. This is 1990, 95, 2000, 2005. Now some of the states, more than one out of every three residents are obese. Look, in Australia, you know, just 30 years ago, one out of every 14 citizens, adults, were obese. Now it's one out of five. And you know, I, I hope that Australia does very, very well in the World Football Cup, in the World Soccer Cup. But I hope that Australia doesn't win the World Cup in obesity. This doesn't make sense with such beautiful parts. So we gotta make the connection. And obesity is just not an issue of looks. It's an issue that there's so many problems, so many health problems related with this. And this isn't rocket science. Either we intake fewer calories or we burn more calories and the parks are on the right side. The intake, taking fewer calories, we see, well, all of these magic diets that we know they don't work. And actually with the World Health Organization, there's a lot of work on the second part, how to increase the levels of physical activity. And we know that a couple of hundred years ago, people, the physical activity was mostly in work, domestic or transportation, but now it's mostly on recreational. So parks, and walkable and bikeable places play a very, very important role. There is a, a wonderful niche for parks to play a role with. Now let's turn from the economic point of view, from, from the point of view of economic, you know. Minneapolis has such a fantastic park system, probably one of the best ones in North America. And the other day I was asking some people in Minneapolis, you know, how much money do you make out of your trail system? And they say, oh, Gil, you know, we don't, we don't really make any money. And say, how many people come to your trails? And they said, you know, last time we counted, it was about 14 million people went to the trails. But they say, you know, we lose 1.8 million on maintenance because we don't charge, it's free. My God, we gotta become much better in parks on making the case. What happens if each one of those 14 million people get a hot dog and a soft drink, $5? That's $70 million. What happens if they get, the city gets 10% sales tax? Then they get $7 million. 
So they actually make it, and if 10% of them stayed overnight and the hotels and the repairs and so on. So we have to make the case so that we get the proper funding and so that we become relevant. So the reality, let me move on to quality of, of, of life for all. I'm going to talk briefly about Bogota, and not really because I was commissioner of Parks and Recreation, or because afterwards one of my brothers became mayor. <laughs> Maybe I did a good job, that's why he became mayor. <laughs> but because Bogota has one ninth the per capita income of Australia. And I'm not saying that Bogota is on the same league as Melbourne. No, I'm not crazy. I mean, I wish. But the reality is that Bogota was going hopeless, and now it's turned 